Hello, everybody. Welcome to we're shining a light on production designers today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all for being. Uh, thank you for being here. I've got three incredibly talented people we're lucky to have in our fair city. Uh, starting on the far side, we have Chris Jones, Los Angeles-based designer who's worked extensively in commercials as well as feature films and television. Most recently, he's known uh, for his work on 20th Century Women with director Mike Mills and was a production designer on the multi-nominated film Lady Bird, directed by Greta Gerwig. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Inbal Weinberg, uh, Israeli-born, New York-based production designer of, among other uh, films, the acclaimed films Frozen River, Blue Valentine, The Place Beyond the Pines, Beasts of No Nation, and most recently, Three, bill three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, directed by Martin McDonough, and the upcoming Suspiria remake, directed by Luca Guadagnino. And finally, next to me is Anastasia Mazzaro, the Oscar and BAFTA-nominated designer of The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, her second collaboration with uh, Terry Gilliam. She also designed the feature film Life for Anton Corbin, who, uh, for whom she also designed the Arcade Fire music video for Reflector, and for which she won the MTV Music Award for Best Art Direction. Most recently, she designed the feature film Tully, starring Charlize Theron and directed by Jason Reitman. Please join me in welcoming them today. <laughs> How many uh, production designers do we have in the room? Or aspiring production designers? <laughs> nice, and how many, how, many, how many directors? There we go, cinematographers, producers, other? Awesome, all right, welcome everybody. Uh, for me, the designer is the person who leads everyone towards what the film will ultimately look and feel like. Uh, then in consultation with the director and hopefully in concert with the director of photography, uh, unleashes the entire art department to achieve through construction, paint, decoration, etc., all the physical services, and now CGI, that are photographed. It's through their expertise and aesthetic that all the questions of character and tone are filtered, resulting in a look that's hopefully unique to the film itself. Um, as a director myself, it's easy one of my favorite collaborations, so much so that whenever prep ends and production begins, and I rarely see them again because they're always a prepping ahead of the main unit, I feel abandoned and miss them terribly. <laughs> Uh, so, before we get into the nuts and bolts, I'd love to ask each of you um, what your relationship to your job is, uh, uh, what you love about it, what, what the core of it uh, is to you. I have an unhealthy relationship to my job <laughs> because when I take a job, I only take ones that I feel that I'm emotionally connected to somehow, and then I'm completely emotionally invested in that job like while I'm working on it. So that's pretty much all I wind up thinking about and I have to remind myself to take some time for myself on weekends or that is all I do. Um, but I love being that invested in a project because that's where, that's when I get inspired. Like I, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to be inspired when I'm that involved in a production. So that's the part I love most about it, is the creating, the being invested in, in these different lives and characters that we build for each show. Beautiful. And Bo? Um, You know, I went to film school as well, even though I already knew I wanted to be a production designer, and I often think that we are making films almost exactly like the director is making the film. If you're lucky, you're seeing the film in your head in the beginning of the project the exact same way that the director is seeing the film. So when you're having the conversations, to me, they transcend production design. You're just conversing about how to make the movie. Um, so I feel like the collaboration is, it transcends the kind of practicality of locations and sets and furniture pieces, and it's really about how to tell the story in the best way possible. Nice. I'd say all the same things, too. I think for me, coming from a fine art background, uh, painting and drawing, et cetera, I, I like the idea of putting all your energy towards the work and the journey that you go on through the process, collaborating with the director and being invested as, as we are. But um, that thing that you make will outlast you, and so you want it to really represent something special, and that, that journey is what's really important for me. Nice. Um, so in watching these three most recent films from uh, these designers, it, I noticed that the central to all three of the films were the main character houses. Um, and because this panel is so short and it's always hard to drill down and get real information, uh, I thought actually we could focus on those three houses and how you can build so much character and story through the design of the spaces around those main characters. 
Um, so we're going to forego clips. I hope you've seen the movie. And if you're not, you're going to get a taste of it here and you can go home and see the movie and, and imagine it through these uh, designers' eyes. Um, but I thought we would start with three billboards outside Ebbings, Missouri, uh, in Ball Weinberg. So, in Ball, tell me the very beginning when this movie came to you, uh, whether it's after your script or your first conversation uh, with Martin or something like that, what was the essence of what it was about for you that informed everything that came after? Well, I mean, it's interesting because with this film, Martin is a playwright and obviously language is very, very important. So the script was really strong. It wasn't necessarily very visual. And I don't even remember if there were many descriptions besides the dialogue. So really, to me, the story was the most poignant thing and the character, the main character, Mildred, and how strong she was. Um, So I, I can't say that immediately I was drawn to the visuals, I think they came with the story. And we started, obviously, first of all, talking about the town, what kind of town it was, and then designing the billboards slowly. So it all sort of came together pretty organically. I think we had a good idea about the milieu, like, you know, what is this town and the world that involves all of the characters. Um, And that's something that we sort of put together I had a presentation that I made for the interview, but a lot of it came together from location scouting and from almost daily meetings with Martin. Um, yeah. What was maybe the first discovery uh, about this town or this character that maybe became the first building block of the design? Of- I mean, what I realized very quickly is that Martin is not going to... Um, except these sort of usual film tricks that we do, like, oh, well, we can be outside of one house, but then the interior is another house. Or, you know, uh, one of the main relationships is between two houses on Main Street. One is a police station and one is the advertising agency. And they, they look at each other a lot. There's like one character looking out a window at another character in the other building. And if you work on film a lot, you're like, well, you know, the chances that we're going to find the two perfect buildings across from each other are slim. So why don't we compromise and say, well, we're going to shoot this person looking out one building, and then we're going to shoot the POV shot somewhere else. We do this all the time. But it didn't even cross Martin's mind. Like, it had to be real architectural, spatial relationships. So in looking for certain places, like the buildings on Main Street or Mildred's house, we were actually looking for very specific spatial relationships. That was really interesting. For example, with Mildred's house, I'm just going to jump right into um, we. It was very important that from her house you could see the billboards because, well, first of all, the story is that her daughter kind of went down this route and disappeared in around the billboards. And also that when we have these scenes outside of the house, you actually see the billboards in the background. And I only realized a few weeks in how important it was to Martin, and that really changed our way of location scouting because we had to find the billboard road with not many buildings around it and needed to look really desolate, but we needed to find one that had some structures, one of which had to be Mildred's house. So that's a lot of factors that have to work out and it really diminishes the oppor- the possibilities because the road had to be perfect and then Mildred's house had to be perfect from the inside because it wouldn't be, we weren't going to do exterior. And then we had to somehow view from the house the billboards. Do you guys all find that the practical challenges lead the discussion to begin with, it's 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 less about uh, imagining something out of thin air as it is starting with okay, we got to start with finding a house that can see the billboards or two buildings across from each other, what have you. I think so. We were talking about this earlier and how we find that <clears throat> your the director especially usually uh, is trying to make the geography work because that's how they kind of picture it. Whereas I think we're more willing to. It, Go, go, we do it too, for sure, like you're talking about, but I think it's it. We know that you can get away with not doing it. And it's amazing how well you can get away with it if you just give your, open up to it. Things don't have to be connected. Um, there's been plenty of times when I felt like I really had to make it work, and in the editing room, it just turns out that it works just fine. It's amazing how well it can work, actually. Well, what you're saying is one of those practical problems is 
the uh, particular aesthetic or, or or challenges of each individual director. I'm sure that changes project to project. It is, and I think we were talking too about how the threshold from interior to exterior is probably one of the hardest things to kind of figure out because you 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 travel through doorways and windows a lot, and you kind of have to make sure that that works. That's the one thing that I think really has to be thought about. It's okay. true. I mean, sometimes oh, sorry. sometimes directors would go the opposite, where they're like, oh, well, no problem. Like, we can find this exterior somewhere else. And you have to explain, well, actually, it is a very sensitive situation. You have to make 100% sure that that's going to match. Um, but in terms of your question about limitations, I find it's very helpful, because... If we could scout the entire world, we would, right? <laughs> so how can we stop ourselves from just saying, but maybe the perfect house is around the corner? A lot of times people think that um, just shooting in locations is easier than building. And I find it a lot of times more difficult because if, it's, if I'm just making it up and creating it from scratch, I find a lot of times it's easier to convince the director and show them... An, a new way to see from nothing than to say, this house will work. We can do this here and this here and this here. But some people are committed to the way it already looks. Mm -hmm. So then it's harder to convince them that you can make it look a completely different way, but we're just going to use the space. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. Uh, so our first slide here, these are the references that uh, Inbal pulled. Uh, tell me where in the process this, this conversation happened uh, about Mildred's house. Um, yeah, usually I do mood boards for, um, uh, probably everybody does them, um, for almost every set, for sure, every important set, and they change by project sometimes, they are like full of images, this one had many different pages, and this is, these are two of the, or a few pages, two of them, and usually that happens you know, in the beginning of pre-production, you slowly start getting reference images. Obviously, if it's a period piece and it has to be historically correct, then you go really deep into research. If it's something contemporary, then it's different. And um, sometimes you can go more conceptual and do fine arts and add just mood pieces. You know, I think the the uh, mood boards can, be, can vary a lot. Um, what we wanted to convey with Mildred's house is that it's dated, it's kind of been the same for a long time, and however, it's not, even though the, something tragic happened and the mood in the house is somber, it's still a very comfortable house. Like We wanted to show that in the past, that family was happy. At some point in their past, they were happy. And so... I liked when I added the two images in, on the right, the black and white, it's sort of like from another era. Like you can imagine that at some point Mildred and her kids had like a loving relationship. Um, and you can feel the warmth through wood and through really dated, let's say, appliances in the kitchen and so on. So in general, I feel that um, mood boards are helpful, of course, for the director, but I also find them very helpful for my crew because we have a large crew and everybody has to be on the same page, construction and shoppers for set decoration. And so mood board is a really great starting point. Yeah, I presume you pass this down to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, Next. That's another part of the mood board, which, um, so for this film and often for others, I do uh, color palettes by set. That was the palette that we decided on for uh, Mildred's house. And I tried on that project to actually do like a textures um, page, which was interesting. I think it worked. It was maybe because with contemporary films, there is less historical reference. And I thought, well, how do we really feel the house? So it was um, different textures. Oh, is that, is that the first time you've done that? Yeah. And I didn't, I don't think I did it on the film afterwards. It, I find that my mood boards really change per project and also per director and per crew, like what is going to be the best way to communicate for these specific people. Just as, as an aside, one of the things I that drives me a little bit nuts about Vancouver locations is they have no texture. <laughs> it's new craftsmen's or whatever we end up shooting. It's uh, uh, so the idea of doing a texture board ahead of time to uh, to add bring that stuff to the house, uh, I think is really great. So I, uh, while we're on this, I'm yeah. interested to know how Chris and, and Anastasia do their mood boards in general. It depends for 
It depends on the director, like you said. Um, for for Tully, I learned I realized early on that I could not show Jason anything out of a magazine or you know you go to the internet and everything's stylized. So he couldn't even be let's do this couch or the, and this chair because it was like no the entire photograph is wrong. So once I realized that pretty quickly, I just started putting out a call for to other to just random people like friends and random people on Facebook, asking them for photographs of their houses, Sp specifically people who had children and especially a lot of first time moms because it's overwhelming. And so that's where I started getting photographs and also on realtor.com, places huh. like that, because not everybody cleans up their houses for shots. And I wanted to see how, how they used stuff, like, you know, things like people are using door casings as chair rail or baseboards and just little things like that that I wouldn't, you know, that are kind of off but real. So that's how I put it together for this one. That really shows up. You'll see when we get to Tully that, that virtually every object seems to have a story behind it, which I think all comes from this kind of research. Um, so this is all kind of conceptual. This is while you're scouting, uh, looking for that Geography, keeping in mind these tones, these palettes, you got, uh, uh, and then you arrive, um, you find your house, and then you bring stuff to it. You've, you've, there's stuff that's there, there's stuff that's, that, you, that, you, that you bring to it. So uh, I, the central part of, of Mildred's house, I think, in, in uh, Three Billboards is this kitchen dining uh, uh, family area. Um, uh, here's four different shots from it. Talk to us about how this developed. Sure, so we found like a perfect billboard road that had about eight houses around it. We scouted all of them. It took me a while to persuade Martin to choose this house, which to me was a no-brainer, um, because there was a better view of the where the billboards would be, because we built the billboards, so you had to imagine where they would be, from another house, but that house was so wrong. So it took a really long time. I'm so thankful that I won that. Um, small battle. Uh, but what was best about this house, which immediately I could see, which is something I'm always looking for, is the flow um, for different planes of action. Because um, a lot of houses are built basically one room, small door, one room, small door. And it's unique to find a house that has a more open layout that's older. And this house had a great kind of almost sunken living room, like a few floor, a few steps, a living room, and then a very large opening into this um, kitchen, and then another large opening into this other dining room. So immediately when we walked in, I realized I could see, I'm always imagining a few different people on the scene. If one person's in the back, one person's here, one person's walking, and so that there's always motion. Um, so that's why I love the house. But in terms of the look of it, it wasn't right. It was... I either built or renovated in the n early 90s, and the owners were, of, co of course, did it all themselves and were super um, proud of it. <laughs> so I had like a wallpaper border of ducks at the top and like really um, very 90s paint job that had these kind of strange kind of faux elements that are very 90s. So immediately we knew we were going to have to exchange a lot. Um, but the bones were definitely there, which is the most important thing. In terms of the kitchen, uh, we did change a lot. Like the appliances were all modern. We had to switch them all out. And where you see one of the photos, you can see that oven. Um, we had to, we actually had to build, those are built in ovens. So the original one they had was modern. And so we had to build this entire facade. Oh, that's a cover. That's covering the, the newer the exactly. Newer oven. Yeah, so we had to take apart an older oven, make a facade of it, and put it on top of you know. So it's those type of things that happen when you work on location. You have to be creative with how to cover things. Like we, all of their counters were made with kind of '90s materials, and so we covered the counters um, and the wallpaper. As I was uh, saying before, actually, um, I had to so. I had picked a wallpaper that was similar to this. It was plaid, but it was had thinner lines. And after putting it up, when I came to visit the set, as they were putting it up, um, I realized that I that that wallpaper is probably going to moray. Which I don't know if you all know what moraying is, but it's this. How do you explain moray? It's what, uh, what happens when you point a camera at a at a, at a uh, 
door screen and everything starts to kind of go wavy and wonky. Yeah. Right, right. It's a kind of... Uh, usually yeah. happens with thin it, lines too close together. Yeah, yeah. right. It, it's usually, it usually happens in, on digital formats and um, because certain lines are somehow make this optical illusion to camera that things are almost dancing on the screen. So uh, immediately got really concerned, took a lot of photos. I wish we had, of course, tested it because usually when we have certain things that look like they're going to moray, we test them on camera or um, earlier. But because things happen so very quickly in film, we didn't get a chance to do that. So he took a lot of photos, drove back to set, show them to the DP and to Martin, and we had decided that it's maybe too dangerous to continue, even though maybe it would work. Uh, so we had to change the plan, and then I went and got the other wallpaper, which is much kind of chunkier and more graphic, which turned out really beautifully. So... You also mentioned the stone, and the, the top right uh, photo above uh, Francis McDormand's head is stone. Is that the stone you were talking about that you, that you also brought in? That was, no, you put this, in? That, uh, that was there. the stone was there. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. The stone was there. And you, yep. all, all three of you, when you're walking into a house scouting and looking for those bones, is it, it, is it a bunch of things? Is it flow, uh, depth? Is it the details, the moldings? Like, what, what, are the, what are the things that pop first for you? It depends, but first off, it has to flow well. It's got to flow for the action. Like you said, like the kitchen and living room and dining room on Tully, same thing. You could see them all through a, you know, through this in the, through the same shot. Yeah, so true. it was more interesting than just having square, large rooms. So size is an issue depending on how the DP and director like to shoot, but definitely the layout of the space because we've got all sorts of tricks to change things to look like something else. But the bones have to be there. The architecture has to be there. When I was scouting for Lady Bird, the, the house that they live in is sort of circular, and that, that flow was nice, not so much for camera, and not so much cause so you could see everything, but I really liked it because here's this family that's in turmoil, but the house is hugging everybody. It's mm. like its arms are around everybody, and it holds the family together. And so that house become very, became very important for that reason, too. And we all, all these movies that we shot, you know, uh, I think Anastasia did one build, but everything was shot in the house completely. We used the house. We didn't do four different houses. It was one house that we used. Did you, did you communicate that somehow to Greta? Did that affect the way she shot the house, do you think? Well, actually, an interesting idea. for me and Lady Bird and 20th Century Woman, those are both movies from people, directors who it's in here because it's their life. And I had to go in and sort of extract that. Listen, I couldn't, I couldn't impose myself as much as I might normally. We did it with color and did it with other things. And the outside world, I could. But this house was really important to Greta that it matched her house in Sacramento. And so we were looking for that house. And we looked and looked and looked. And we found the house. The guy that owned it was named Mr. Man. And we, had, we found this house that was this flow. And when Greta and I first walked in, we kind of walked through quietly and we're looking and Sam, the DP, was there too. And it had everything we wanted. But the best thing was that we kept walking separately and finding each other through doorways and windows. And that was like, okay, that's perfect. And the kitchen in Lady Bird is exactly like the kitchen in Greta's parents' house. Almost identical. I had a really similar... That brings up... A lot of times I work on things where the director has written the script and has and is vested in it. And when I worked on Perks of Being a Wallflower, it's even the writer of the book Not that yet. then directed the movie about his life. So literally we scouted his parents' house just for reference. And we scouted, we ended up shooting on his parents' street. And whenever I, he would be like, hey, like, do you have a blah, blah, blah? And I was like, oh, let me check. He, he was like, just go get it from my mom's basement. And I had the keys to his parents' house. Like, that's how intense the stuff is, and you have to really navigate it. As Chris said, like, you can't just explore to the full extent of your production design prowess because it's really about someone else's childhood or memories. Yeah. Like, Mama, the cabin in the woods, the mid century modern cabin in the woods, that first we were just looking for a cabin in the woods. And then slowly, 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 Andy came out, actually, I want a mid-century modern cabin in the woods. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't exist. <laughs> We're going to have to build it. And then one step further, his grandparents mid-century modern. And I was like, you're killing me. Because <laughs> like, I found that out over a period of weeks. And we were at the point where we were going to hire like helicopters to go out looking for stuff. So it's like when, it, when it's so personal, 
it it's just it adds an, a weight, another layer. Yeah. How do you how do you determine what's necessary? Because there's a point at which you're like, okay, you just got to step away from your parents' house, and you know, there's other houses in the world, kind of thing. But obviously, there's a reason that they're it's one a would delicate hope, situation. Yeah, one would hope there's a real reason why they're connected to it. Uh, um, is does it usually work out that it's for a, a, a specific reason, or is it just they don't want to undo the knot that in their head of this thing they put together by reimagining it through another space? You know. That was the first time it happened to me. Okay. And there wasn't really much to, because it happened through the entire movie. It was also like, oh, actually, I also have my friend stuff that I want you to put in this set. So there's only so much you can, yeah. you know, do about that. I think on 20th, there was this moment. Mike is super, super specific. And we, my onset dresser was, had PTSD at the end of the job because you, 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 he would come in and he would look and he would look at it and he'd do this thing. And he was seeing what he saw in his childhood, and he was going like that. And then he'd walk up, and he'd, don't tell the union, but he would go in, and he would like do all this moving it around, and he would change this and do this, and then he would do this and fluff the, the plant just right, and then he was okay. And that's what you deal with every single day sometimes, because that's, it's just here, you know. We've yeah. done everything. There were times when I was just rolling my eyes, too. But, you know, in general, it really, it, it works to everyone's advantage to have him do that. To a certain extent, yeah. because then it, the flow goes better. You know, it's like he's he's happy, we're all happy. We gave him everything he needed. Sometimes you're just the hands. You really are just the hands of somebody else, and that's okay too. You have to give that up sometimes. It's, you can't fight against it. It's got to work. You're collaborating with somebody on their vision, so you have to do that. Interesting. Uh, so this next slide we have is Mildred's uh, uh, bedroom. I'm really uh, inspired by this wallpaper. I don't know why I'm so captivated Thank by you. it, but. <laughs> Just for such a dark story, it just it, it, I, one decision seems to d provide so much to this character. And, uh, I think I was so happy about this wallpaper as well, especially because I love wallpaper so much. Um, I, also, I also love it when production designers come running into the office excited about a wallpaper they've just found. It's, oh, it's, you it's, don't it's even kind, It's no. kind of the moment you're off and yeah. running. Right? <laughs> um, we had explored a lot of different kinds of wallpaper for this house. Originally, I was thinking, okay, it's going to be a bland 80s pattern. We had a lot of very boring... Uh, patterns and colors and I just saw this as I was browsing for vintage wallpaper um, I saw this design and I was like okay wait this would be really out there but let's get it because Martin is funny he loves like little things like that like he really loves animals so any anywhere we could put a rabbit a rabbit is like his thing it's but he's had rabbits in every one of his films since his short movie so Things like that where he, he loves this kind of unexpe unexpected moment. And of course, for this film and the scene that is in the bedroom is where Mildred is talking to her. I don't know if everyone's seen the film, but she's kind of talking to her slippers and she's uh, making her slippers talk to each other. I don't know how to explain it, but it's a very interesting moment, which is really, really dark and also hilarious at the same time. So I thought, oh, that would be really beautiful for that moment and for that house to all of a sudden have this unexpected. And then I showed him all the wallpaper and he immediately went for the butterflies, which was so great because it was really a lot more out there than the other options. And rare that you can design a set for one scene. There's only the one scene in there, is it? Yeah, okay. Sadly, a lot of times we design a full set for one scene and it could be literally two seconds. So yeah. for example, in this set, we thought about every little thing you know we had boxes of stuff i don't think you can see here but we had boxes of things that are um her husband's stuff that he hasn't let, taken out of the house and she doesn't want to deal with so we had to think up okay what kind of stuff would be in the boxes of you know charlie's boxes and what kind of little things are on you know it's you think of every little thing, and then you see it for a split second, obviously. Uh, that happens to us all the time, and I'm sure we all can talk about it for a long period. You have to sort of embrace the fact that A, it's for you, you wanna do the best job, B, it's for the actors, and then C, it's, I feel like there's some karma in the movie that works if all of it is done right, and you, maybe you can't necessarily see it, but it's there in, in a kind of meta way. And um, and actually, I was collaborating a lot with Fran on the house. Sometimes you work closely with actors. Um, and Fran told me afterwards that her favorite moment in the house was when we were in the bed together. Oh. So it was really sweet. Yeah. 
It's lovely. Okay, I was, was going to talk about Dixon's house, which is also amazing, but... Already running behind. So, uh, 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 I'm going to move on to Lady Bird. Um, Chris, you, you've already mentioned that this is slightly different and that you're not working with somebody who's invented something. You're working with somebody who's telling her story and you have to kind of get inside her head and find that thing. What, where does that start? How, what, what, did you, what, what did you and Greta initially discuss? How do you, how do you go about doing something like that? We, we scouted her parents' house. That was yeah. the first thing we did. Um, but that was good. And we met her parents. So we saw how they were different than the two main characters that were her parents. And then we also saw how they were alike. So that's helpful. It's good because it kind of teaches you what you can get away with and what's different. Because Greta has to make it fictionalized to a certain extent. Mm. Um, I think the first thing that Greta and Sam, the DP, said was, we want this to feel like a nostalgic film, even though it's 2003. We want it to feel like there's, it's dreamlike. Even though it's very naturalistic and very real, we, we worked hard to make this real world feel special. And I think that the balance that we're all doing here often is finding naturalism versus art directed. And you don't want to be taken out of the movie because you see everything that you've done or we've done. You really want it to feel like it works and it belongs. And I, that's, a, that's actually one of the things that I think we're all really proud of is that you, you get to the end of the movie and you weren't taken out of the movie because something was, was wrong or felt it distracted you. So that was number one. Number two was color. I really, I use color all the time in my films. I think contrast, whether it's lack of color, whether it's darks and lights, whether it's pink and blue like you see here, that's really important to me. And as soon as they dyed Saoirse's hair pink, it was just like, okay, this, this is the beginning of something that we're going to have in front of colors throughout the whole film. So pink became very important, weirdly, because the room ended up being pink, even though we didn't choose that in the very beginning, her, her bedroom. Um, but oh. color's very important. Interesting. Is, did that come out of the hair? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. I mean, the bathroom was the way we found it, but the hair lent itself to it. it we, we kept thinking purple. We kept thinking purple, uh, not deep purple, but like a lavender. But that's so Pottery Barn, and we wanted to do something that was a bit more shocking and a bit more like punches you in the gut a little bit. So we decided to go for pink. I can speak more to that when we get to the bedroom about the layers of history. That's also part of it. Yeah. Um, but she, I don't know if the next slide is the Wayne Tebow stuff, yeah. but, but she wanted Sacramento to be represented in many different ways. The art that we had in there was from Sacramento. The vibe was Sacramento. Even though that top picture has, a, I believe, a palm tree in the back, we shot, some, we shot most of it in L.A. and only a week in Sacramento. No palm trees. Just That was Greta's rule, no palm trees. So we tried our hardest to do that. Um, but there's a painter named Wayne Thiebaud from Sacramento who taught at the sc our School of Art, and all of his paintings are of very lickable looking ice creams and pinks and blues and turquoises. And so she said Wayne Thiebaud, and I just went crazy because I've never done a movie in pastels before, and we decided let's just do pastels. The Catholic school that we had scouted and found already had pastel colors on one wall of every single room. So there were pinks and blues and lime greens, and it was just perfect. The nuns were gray, just totally no color, no excitement, no fun. But everything else was exciting. And there's also a lot of green in Sacramento, and a lot of local Sacramento painters we had on their walls of their house, there was green there as well. So that was the wish. Nostalgic, color, and always benefiting the story without being too art directed. It was nice because I still was able to art direct it. But Sam was also going to do a treatment with the film. He wanted it to look like it was on 16 millimeter, which we couldn't do because we couldn't afford it, weirdly. So we went and did the digital, fil digital but he did a treatment. And that's why it has that weird kind of yellowy, hazy effect, which then meant that every color choice I made was going to be affected by yellow. And it became kind of difficult because the pink room, we had to do tests to make sure the pink wasn't going to turn orange. Yeah, you probably had to test every room, I imagine, eh? especially that one. Just that. I think we sort of embraced it at a certain point and just thought it's going to do what it's going to do. Plus, it was not an effect that was permanent. They could tweak it in post. Gotcha. But still, he was pushing it pretty hard in the tests, and I was kind of, I wasn't so sure. But now I'm glad because the whole film has this warmth to it that you feel, and that's the nostalgia that we're, we're talking about. They were inspired by a Xerox. They made a Xerox of something, and I remember going into their, uh, Greta's office one day, and they were just like laughing and excited, and just, oh my God. And I was like, what do you, look at the Xerox. And it was, that was the basis for the graininess of the whole film, was the Xerox that they had made. <laughs> but you bring up an interesting point, is that it's kind of hard for us to know what 
the final film is going to look like because, you know, color correcting happens months and months and months after we're done with the film. And even if some most decisions should be made originally, like things can really change a lot. So we do color test. I mean, we do testing the camera, um, the DP tests everything in the beginning of pre-production and then you're supposed to bring in things like, oh, is there a color you're unsure of? And if the production is running really well and you already know what the main colors of your main sets are, then you can really test it. But so often decisions are made after that initial test that, you know, you have to, yeah, that's a challenge to know exactly what colors are going to end up being the final Hmm. ones. All right, so Lady Bird's bedroom. Take us through this incredible... uh, (laughs) I was telling these guys last night that two people have told me that they were their graduate thesis paper was on the cultural significance of Lady Bird's bedroom, which is pretty exciting but weird at the same time. Um, Lady Bird's bedroom came. uh, Greta really wanted it to be. We 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 scouted the house. We painted the walls pink. We started dressing it, and we were kind of behind in schedule, and we were moving really fast. Um, Lady Bird's bedroom is supposed to show the layers of her life. And so that's why there's this younger girl's desk set you see in the top right picture. And the headboard was really something that Tracy Spadorcia, the set decorator, found. It was really perfect. And it began to kind of come together. But we didn't have time. And we just were kind of getting behind. We'd been already shooting in the rest of the house. And we were not done with the walls yet. And Greta came in, and we were talking, and she said, it's just not there yet. And I was like, I know. So in one night, I went to basically the equivalent of a very spectacular Michaels in uh, in L.A. called uh, Michael, um, not Michael Levine, that's Fabrics. Um, I can't remember the name of the store now. But it's just full of gigas and doodads and stickers. So all that stuff you see was one grocery trip in a basket that we came back, and then the morning of the shoot... Me, Greta, the, the decorator, the lead man, the producer, we were just coating the walls with stuff. Now, fortunately, we had done enough pre-thought about what, what, what it was going to be like. Like, you can see there's the posters that she has at school. There's things that she's created. But what was nice was that even though we had started it and we all kind of threw everything up, it it really worked because it's, that's what girls and boys do. They, they, they just keep putting stuff up. This is her space. This is not the rest of the house. And the rest of the house is super clean and super, like her mom is like, you know, you, there's a scene where she tells her she doesn't fold the towels right. And that's the rest of the house. But this is her space. This is where she gets away with what she wants. But it was also fun because again, color, that turquoise ball lamp in the bottom left or bottom right picture, I really... It just was something Tracy picked. It's perfect. It goes with everything else. The blue car you saw out front, the blue this, the blue that, the pink and the blue. Everything really came together nicely. Um, the quotes Greta wrote on the wall, um, the uh, CD covers that we had, which is one of the few things you can afford to get rights for because the art is actually cheaper to clear than other things, are all from 2003. Bikini Kill, I think there's Sonic Youth, there's a bunch of other. The Pixies was a big one we did. All this stuff was sort of happening in the late 90s and 2000s. So layer upon layer did happen quickly, but as we got into shooting, we kept kind of adding and subtracting. And we also stole all the wardrobe from the costume department so we could stick it in the closet and always have the door open. And April was just like, where's my shirt that I need for this thing? It's in the closet. closet. I love the doors open. It's one of the first things I noticed. Uh, uh, Any tricks on getting past clearances quickly? Because that is when you're decorating a room, especially on a low budget, you're throwing stuff up on the wall you got to clear all that stuff it really depends on the show okay. so like network television you're clearing oh, yeah. everything everything yeah. and, over, and and then some so it really depends um on the, the production the, it's, company it's the lawyer attached to the production company yeah because i find that lawyers err on the side of caution so it's always no 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 so then it's i mean on on i did a pilot and uh at the beginning of the year and they wanted not only my drawing of whatever they wanted my inspiration mm-hmm. and it was like well wait a second some of it i just made up out of my head and out of years of remembering stuff and they're like no we need to f- you, we need to know that, that you can prove that this was yours and it was like if i did this on it like it, it that's crippling so i worked on a show where, where we had a similar panic to what you were talking about chris and and uh and they went, ran out and grabbed coffee mugs and stuffed animals and all kinds of stuff to dress this uh, this apartment and uh, and it turned into a three hundred thousand dollar VFX bill to change the coffee mug and change the eyes on the teddy bear and all this stuff. Wow. 
And it feels like it was entirely because of the lawyer, uh, because something tells me that that's the same thing you guys did, but you didn't have a lawyer telling me you had to change it all. Well, it's funny because it depends on the clearance person you have on the job. Um, you know, Anastasia was saying she insists that we ha that she has one, and you do. You need to have somebody else thinking about that, or it just eats up your time. You can't be thinking about that. Yeah. But on Ladybird, the clearance guy said, on 20th Century Woman, the guy was super hardcore. Like, you couldn't do anything. It was, I felt like I was crippled. But on this one, the guy's like, as long as it's used in the real world, you can use it. As long as it's not art or something that's copyrighted, like books. And, and I, we, it took me a while to get used to that. Like, okay, like I can really show all these shampoos at the grocery store? He's like, yeah, it's the real world. It's like what you see. It's okay. You can see suave. You know, it's okay. And I, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. But it went very smoothly until the dorm scene where... Um, we had to have some obscure, crazy Japanese film poster that the dude at school would have, you know, like that was the thing. So I had to go down to the old poster store on my, my, myself because we didn't have any time. And I'm looking through all these Hollywood films and I find a few Japanese ones, you know, some Kurosawa films. And I found this one, I don't even remember what it was, but it was one of those big posters. And I, show, I took pictures and on my phone, sent it off. Everybody happy with this one? And they're all like, that's perfect. We'll just deal with it later. Even the producer. Uh oh. <laughs> I think, you know, they wanted me to spend $100, and it was $9,000 later they had to get clearance on the Japanese obscure film that was on the wall that you just saw the corner of. It's pretty crazy. Ouch. I can say that um, I feel like this sort of clearance thing goes in trends, like from probably when we started working in the industry, things started getting much, much, much um, harder and more strict. And in the past couple of years, there's been a, a great positive change where sort of indie film companies have started using fair law use uh, clauses more often where they say exactly what they told Chris, because was it 824? Yeah. A24, way to go. Um, and some other film companies that say as long as the product is used in a fair way, we there's not going to be, you know, like we take full responsibility. Of course, if you show someone driving and drinking a Budweiser, that's never going to clear it in, in, in any world. But if someone's sitting down to breakfast and has an orange juice, you know, that's how we, That I think the same thing happened on Three Billboards. And I am very encouraged by that um personally i also realized on my last film because directors don't want to know about clearance you can't just turn to the director and tell them i'm sorry i have to take my your, your favorite magazine away because it's not cleared and a lot of times production designers find themselves in between production and the director because the director just wants something and they don't care and it's very hard to explain the clearance world it's hard to explain it to yourself sometimes um so lately i've actually learned from my last director who was very, very, very adamant ag adamantly against clearance that, you know what, it's not my responsibility. So if production really cares, they should send somebody to look through the set and figure out if everything is cleared. But if the director is, is it like, you know, taking his favorite book and just putting it on the table, then it's not my responsibility. That's how I feel about it nowadays. Wow. Uh, the kitchen. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that thing about mom having everything in the right place because I think this kitchen is uh, is a good example of that. Every appliance is like six inches apart from the next appliance. But I think you can it's very see, sparse compared yeah, to yeah. And it, we did that on purpose because um, she works and she doesn't have. She has. She's making eggs. She's making them breakfast. You asked a good question, uh, Scott, the other night. Why are there only four chairs when there's five people in the family? And I said because Shelley is the new addition and the mom tends to give up everything for everybody. That's her problem in a way, is that she's constantly giving, 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 even though she's angry about it all the time. Um, but I think the color scheme, like even look at the little blue mugs on the right, bottom right picture, and the, the little bit of hits of color. And Greta wanted to have a map on the wall because it has pins where they've been, and there aren't very many pins. But the map shows possibility. It shows this is where we're, we're gonna, we wanna go. And she had one on the wall, her dad had one. Hmm. And, and uh, the dad in the movie is so great. He's so, so good. And we all had to clear the house at one point because the, the stove was leaking gas and we all freaked out. <laughs> Loc location uh, scooting. Okay, I'm going to move on to Tully here. There's so much to see in, this, uh, in these movies. Um, uh, put something in the drawer. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Tully is a story about uh, uh, Charlize Theron plays a mother who's overwhelmed with her baby and really wishes somebody would come along and help her. Uh, and... Yes, you've made this 
incredible house, half location and half build. I hope we get, we'll get to the build part because I'm quite blown away by this build that they did. Um, that's I can only call it a beautiful mess. Uh, it looks like it looks like every house with kids I've been in, but thank you. But not in that way where I, I could so see an art department coming in here, especially one that's in a rush and under budgeted, and just throwing shit on the ground and throwing in the thing. But everything here seems so placed and, and up, it's, it's everything has a story behind it. Like there's so much history in these in the in the way this is done. So so how did you how did you accomplish this? How did you uh, Well the house it's supposed to be in Rye, New York. And we I mean, they're not poor, they're not rich. And we thought, okay, they bought this house um when they already had one child and a new one. So they had like two and they thought, you know what? We'll, we'll get it now and we'll renovate it. And then all of a sudden they've got a third one. So they're just, the, the, you know, another one's coming and they're just overwhelmed. And we put in things like, you'll see it in the bathroom set, it's more obvious, but there's, there's places where, you know, dad has started to fix things up or tried to start fixing things up and just left the wall half plastered and never got to sanding and painting it. And he just gave up because they're just overwhelmed. So initially, we wanted, um, we considered building it, and budgetary issues prevented us from building it. But the layout essentially here was exactly what I had drawn, um, slightly smaller, um, and we had a we had off the kitchen we had a, a, a staircase going down to a bedroom, and so we decided that's where the kids could go, um, and that bedroom was meant to be where the little boys' room was first, and now the little girl has been displaced because her room's turning into a nursery. And so she's put down there. So the little boy's room is obviously a little boy's room. It's, it's got like horsey, horsey wallpaper, horsey border used as a chair rail, um, oddly colored walls. Um, and then with her girly stuff in, but it was primarily the little boy's room. So they got in there, they just didn't get around to renovating and people really judge this house. <laughs> I found people are like, wow, it's either they're living in squalor or wow, it's not really renovated. And I, I'm like, well, what's going to happen if I come to your house? Like, what does your house look like? Especially if you've just bought a house, like people were really judgmental about this house. But I was like, I've been into lots of people's houses now from just like regular people that are not designers and ask for a lot of, you know, a lot of pictures and mm, people aren't living in magazine homes. No. no One of not. my favorites was, this was truly a favorite because it was perfect. It was a young couple who, you know, thought they were really cool. They had this like framed photo of a gun in the dining room. Yeah, it was like this cool framed kind of like painting of a gun and they just had a baby and they've completely given up. Like the, the dining room table is covered with plastic that you get at the hardware store. There's a box of diapers. There's some Cheerios stuck to the plastic. I was like, I showed Jason, he's like, this is what our table's gonna look like when they're not eating at it. Cause it was like, they just like, the diapers didn't even make it to the, you know, to the, to the closet and there's the gun on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just like to say that it's really, I think what Anastasia's done really well is that it, it's difficult to look at this on camera sometimes and it freaks the DP out and it freaks other people out a little bit. You have to be very careful and you have to do, you do have to take things away, but you did a great job of making it be busy, but not so busy that you're distracted. I mean, that oh, picture of you. Charlize, you know, she's got a lamp behind her head, but it works because then, then, and then if people don't get it, you say, well, that's the halo effect of some sort of psychological thing that I thought of. <laughs> and then everyone goes, that is so cool. And then I, th I think I think the wallpaper and the art and the sweater. The, I mean, the, the whole thing is is so out there, but works somehow. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, love it. What well, would you guys talk about when it comes to color? Is it I, all the color seems to come from the kids' stuff? Is it, was um, that the it, was color that actually came from the f uh, like a feeling of autumn yeah. and. Jason and I, when we first started talking about the look, we about the movie, we started talking about mostly the relationships of these people and what they were like. And because we're similar age to them, it was mostly about, you know, what did, like, like Charlize thinks of herself as she was cool, like, back in the day, but was she actually really cool? So it was a lot of, you know, taking from our childhood. And, you know, we grew up watching John Hughes films and The Goonies, and we wanted the house to feel like those old movies that weren't aspirational in terms of like, mm. you know, set decoration before they came into like, these gorgeous magazine spreads. So we walked into one location actually, and all everything was wrong, but the furniture colors, like all like the, the, the couch color, the, the carpet color, 
the wood was so perfect. I snapped a shot of that and showed Jason, like, this is what we've been talking about. And he's like, it is. So I put that up on the wall and was like, my, my satagrader was confused. She was like, what is this hideous thing? And I'm like, no, 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 it's just our, it's just our color palette. And so then that translated as well with the costumes. So we, we brought it in by like that wood wall wasn't there. Obviously the wallpaper everywhere. Um, Nice. Th there were some great shops like with that that couch. When I saw the couch, I'm like, that's the couch. And my set decorator was like, have you lost your mind? That's hideous. <laughs> but I'm like, that's the couch. And I decided that these were the types of people who, um, you know, put up framed photo, like framed kids. Like they think their kids are great artists. And so they put them on the walls. Do you guys all work closely with your costume designers? Sometimes they're in different rooms and it's hard to communicate. But But it seems like, you know. There's nothing worse than a black shirt walking in when you're shooting. Like I'll just say something wall. really short. I, I, I feel that that's where the mood boards actually come in really handy. Yeah. Because if you give them a color palette, you can just give it to them and then you can walk away. And they usually tend to see that and make decisions. One of the things that happened with Lady Bird was April's costumes were unique and creative. But on 20th Century Woman, Jennifer did colors that I couldn't have even dreamed that it would be as good as she did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't talk to her because we were so busy. You could barely talk to her. But they work so well. It's like opposites and not opposites and blends and, and it was just because she had the color palette and once you do that that's the story you need it's really it really changes by project and it changes by the director because some directors really believe in full collaboration between the dp the costume designer and yourself and some directors are more like you know what you are all artists you should do your thing and not be influenced by each other which just happened to me so you know, you don't always get to view the other person working at the same time. They could already have pretty advanced ideas by the time you have your first conversations. So you have to hope that it's in the right direction. And also, I do find that sometimes, as you had pointed out before with the, with, uh, the flowers, there's beautiful accidents. Not everything has to be coordinated. You know, certain films you talk about the exact type of red. Oh, yeah. And then this came about because Scott was asking if we had thought about this particular shot, which I never even noticed before. I mean, I chose the um, curtains, and then it just sort of happened that Sam was wearing this shirt. Like, yes, we had a lot of different conversations about different things, but this one just kind of came, came about, which is always the beauty of the accidents in film. Okay, last but not least, I wanted, before we get to some quick questions, if we have time, uh, Anastasia, you had to build the second floor of this house, as you mentioned, so often do. Yeah, because uh, the second floors uh, are usually too small. This blew me away, because usually, I think, I pride myself on being able to tell when it's a set or not, <laughs> and, and this this got right past me, uh, especially the bathroom, uh, uh, because of the details like that, the, like that pony wall behind the bathroom tub, and like, so... Uh, yeah, how do you how do you build this set? The paint on that door, all of that, all the wear and tear on the carpet, on the floor. Whoops, I'm gonna go back. Um, where do you start on that? Is it just having good painters and a good set. It's, deck it's having good painters and providing good reference as well. And and when I do a f like when I do a floor plan, I also it it's horrifying to the people I'm giving the information to, which is my set designer, my art director. But I write notes up all over my drawing and then I give it to them to please translate it and make it look acceptable <laughs> to the poor construction and paint people. Um, and that pony wall was confusing to some people, but it was just specifically for that scene so she could wash her mom's hair. But like, for example, that, that little handle there to help you mm -hmm. get out, that was a remnant of, oh, look, some older people lived mm -hmm. here, so let's put that. Like, that's another place that they didn't get to and, um, and things like that, like the, the odd the odd cabinetry and the the little tiles were actually all handmade. Oh, wow. They were not purchased because I couldn't find them. And then the painter, like he seen it, brought in even his like his family was painting them on like at home on the weekend to get them done. I felt like I felt so bad. I didn't know <laughs> until the day of, and I was like, I'm so sorry. I also love this little tent outside, right outside the door. <laughs> yeah, that was like you know the kids just play. Just they've they play. taken over the house. 
And, and you know, if she's got three children. Yeah. Like, yes, please go occupy yourselves and play I, somewhere. I, I immediately imagine that told the story of, oh, the, oh, this kid's playing while still in sight of mom who's changing something, you know, the, the baby or what, you know, like it was, yeah. there, there's so much story in these little decisions. Made. And I wanted to add that it's interesting that when you go scouting, you're, you're looking for the perfect house, but you should always be looking at everything else for ideas anyway. Mm-hmm. And that little handlebar you're talking about reminds mm-hmm. me of like, you, you, you would have seen that maybe in another house and you stuck it in your mind and you kind of kept yeah. it for I that keep, idea. I keep files of weird things. And then that back I to see. our idea of post versus what's real. That bottom left photo, which has the tile, is so different than the bathtub. But in the actual film, it kind of blends together. But I prefer the weirdness of the picture you have, which is the pink tile with the blue tub. And it's kind of like this odd thing, but it, it still reads in the film. But you can see how it can change so much in post. Mm-hmm. And we did things like I don't know if you've seen the movie, but it's not not the movie that was sold to you in. The trailer because it couldn't be because or else it was given it was going to give stuff away so we left all these easter eggs all over the sets like the the built-in little soap dish is is a shell there's all these vibes of her being underwater and her drowning so that's why the themed tub is blue and there's there's like hooks and anchors there's uh, wallpaper with shells on it in the kitchen and it was specifically so that you know and even here the way she the way she's she, she's like a mermaid in the tub. And, and I know we want to get to questions, but it, that, that open drawer that Scott showed, we were all talking about this last night and how fun it is to, like Inbal said in the beginning, the best part about being a production designer is making it what you want it to be, even in my case when I'm w- working with somebody who's making it out of memory. When you have an actor that opens a drawer and it's actually dressed, it's like the best thing in the world. Like that can be the most exciting thing that happens all day. The other thing is that um, in, you know, the father's a failure in Lady Bird to a certain extent. So, it's a Catholic film. It's about religion. It's about love. It's about family. And I was putting birds, of course, that's the obvious thing to put in a movie called Lady Bird around the house. But I also put in pictures by William Blake because they're, she wants to be learned and go to school in New England. And they're William Blake's Job, which is about the father who's failing and not providing the right things for God. And the father of this story is like that. And those are the things that you may have never have seen, but it's so exciting to put it in there because you're like, this is my Easter egg. This is what I am into. And you have to walk on that set. And even if it's not perfect, be very happy with it. You have to just know that I've satisfied my own creativity, not just the director's. And the actors must love that stuff when they discover it, I'm sure. All right, you better get to questions before they kick us out of here. You here? a tip for directors um, that you would give them, what would it be uh, in terms of what you do and what you would want them to be aware of, of how you work? What do you like in a director? I think, <laughs> I think for, uh, for up-and-coming directors who are maybe even first-timers, I would say not, do not be hesitant about asking questions about the art department because it's actually a pretty complex department perhaps more complex than other departments because we're everywhere, we deal with everything, and we have often the largest crew. So I do not, I, I've do. worked with a lot of first-time directors, and even non-first-time directors often are confused by how we make things happen. And I feel that that kind of mystery, even though alluring, could uh, bring misconceptions about how hard you're working, or you know how many resource, how much, many resources you need. So I would say have sit, have a sit down conversation about the basics of how we work, how our department works, who is in charge of what, what is the process of per- building, what is the process of set decorating, because I think that's a really good basis to build from. And also, don't be afraid, like, don't think you're hurting my feelings if you don't like something. Telling me you don't like something is is as much good information as telling me you like something. Because especially if I haven't worked with you before, I'm trying to feel you out to figure out how you work, what it is that you like, what it is that you don't. And I'm not insulted by, you know, by, you know what, like, I really hate that. That's awesome. You've just told me, you've just given me a ton of information and now I'm going to change course and try to give you something you do like. So tell me. Over here. I'm uh, just wondering with films like Beasts of No Nation, where you're out shooting in like Ghana and so many, so much exteriors, if you had to like modify the way you worked. Oh yeah, immensely. I would say working in Ghana was definitely the biggest like cultural experience of my work. 
uh, life because you really, I mean, whenever you work in a different place, you're, you really have to think again about your own work methods and not just that, but as a human being, your own perception of the world, because for sure in Africa, it's almost like a par parallel universe. And you realize that everybody there feels very comfortable working within that world. And they have their own ways of working that perhaps make absolutely no sense to you, but makes su super sense to them. So it's a really interesting way of kind of accepting that your way of thinking is not necessarily the one to enforce. But at the same time, if you don't push your own way of doing things, perhaps the film is never going to happen. So it's kind of a back and forth conversation about how to work with local practices and how to understand local resources. And I think that it's really enriching as a human being, just the same as a production designer. Nice. Uh, first, I just want to note that we don't have the same fair use um, legality in Canada that we do in the U.S., so don't everybody run out and go, yay, I can put everything in my movie now. <laughs> um, and my question for you guys is, when I've produced and directed, I've found that like uh, production designers and the art team have the longest marathon. They work the hardest, and they are probably the most likely to go under severe mental stress, lack of sleep, and everything else. Do you have thoughts with regards to how to, as a director and producer, better support your art team? Make a decision. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's so nice of you. That's right. Make make decisions and make decisions together and and push to get the problem solved. That's the only thing you can do. I mean, it it it's not always going to get solved. You, you it you're, it's going to take time. But I think that. Try to be as organized as you can be, because we appreciate that too. We're we have so much on our table, as does the director, of course, and the producer too. But you know, it, it's it's just it's it's organic. It has to kind of flow. There is no, I think, solid answer to that except do your best at being as organized as possible, because that will help the collaboration move smoothly. I think with producers, to me, it's like a bit of a contentious relationship from the get go, because almost always your first conversation is, I don't. I need more money, and the producer says you are not going to have more money. So from the first moment, it feels like a confrontation, and I think the best thing to do is actually start out from a very positive place to say we're making this together, and let's deal with every problem together. Let's be open to co even if there isn't more money. Let's just assume that that's our problem, not the art department's problem. And so whenever I've had that attitude from producers is when I feel like it's the best for the film. Don't ever say you have to be creative, right? <laughs> like that's the one that gets me, like, because we're not. Yeah, that's right. We're <laughs> it's time to get creative. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Time. It's, you're gonna need to be creative. <laughs> I'm feeling pressure from the right. Oh yeah, no, I got the full on sign. Thanks everybody. Uh, I'm sure they're open to Thank questions you. in the lobby if you want to talk to them. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys. <laughs>